All righty. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Um, we really appreciate you taking this time out of spending this hour and a half with us uh, to hear about the challenges to reentry for those who are returning home from prison who are of considered special populations. My name is Walisha Wilson. I am the board director of New Life Second Chance Outreach. And again, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we will go ahead and let me see. Let me share my screen. There we go. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to go ahead and get started. How do you move this little slow screen? There we go. And again, this today's meeting is um, about addressing the challenges to successful reintegration for formerly incarcerated people who are older, trans, living with mental illness or substance use disorder, or who are forced to register on state sex registries. And this event is a part of our Georgia Reentry Awareness Month events. This is our eighth annual Reentry Awareness Month in Georgia. And so for the eighth year, Georgia's governor has approved our proclamation request to observe July as Reentry Awareness Month throughout the state. So all of July, we are bringing awareness of the challenges to reentry, highlighting the successes of those returning home, like myself, from incarceration. And we're hosting reentry focused events, including in-person events, dinners, and fellowships. So if you're able to join us, we hope that you'll be able to join us. Um, we'll make sure we drop the link in the chat as well. But those links are also hyperlinks. So when you send the, uh, get the email, you'll be able to click on it. We are in desperate need of volunteers. We are an all-volunteer organization who spend our time, our talents, and our money with running this organization and doing the work that we do throughout Georgia and some parts of Alabama. So we hope that you'll support us as well as volunteer. We need help with some of everything. And so we want to say thanks to our donors. People donated during this month. Uh, last year, we were able to actually start helping assist folks with getting their IDs, which is a very big challenge for people who are coming home from prison who didn't have IDs or birth certificates. So we were able to do that. And so thanks to our donors for this month and our sponsors, uh, the Housing Simons Foundation, Restore Georgia, the DeKalb County Library System, Fair Count, Elysium Consulting, A New Way of Life, ProMed Medical Consulting, as well as Taking Charge LLC. So we really, really appreciate our donors who have been really supporting us throughout this month um, to help us with provide groceries for individuals a couple of weeks ago, gift cards, um, and also to provide some things such as utility assistance and things to help those that we serve. Thank you so very much. Our mission is to end mass incarceration by equipping, empowering, and restoring socially, economically, and civically disadvantaged Georgians who are impacted by an arrest, conviction, or incarceration by providing services, resources, advocacy, and grassroots organizing that supports the replacing of carceral systems of oppression with person and community-centered solutions and access to resources that support freedom, inclusiveness, equity, and economic sustainability. So before we get on to our panel introductions, we wanted to start, um, just do a little disclaimer um, to support you on your journey with some things that are changing. Um, and one of our big, one of our big things here, and my big thing um, is language. Um, today, a, a lot of people, over two million folks, are incarcerated in the United States jail and prison system, and people with criminal justice histories are referred to in a lot of dehumanizing terms, such as felon, inmates, prisoners, convicts, offenders. So we just want to know that words have power. Language have power. The way that we refer to individuals has power. Um, and these dehumanizing languages, these labels stereotype and marginalize us, time or circumstance in our lives, rather than support us as the people that we are currently. And so as we attempt to rebuild our lives, we um, are not defined by our conviction history uh, and the words that we use to refer to people should reflect our full identities, our abilities, and acknowledge our potential and capacity to change and grow. So as you are in this, um, in this space, as well as going forward in other spaces, we like to encourage you to be mindful of how you speak about people, 
who are impacted by the criminal legal system and other social systems um, of society and that people are people and we're not just our criminal record. So instead of using terms like inmate, prisoner, and convict, and felon, you, you want to humanize people and call them a person who is incarcerated or a person with a felony, a person is on probation. Same thing with the terms um, sex offender. Uh, it's a person with a sex offense, a person on the registry, or a person forced to register or a registrant. Um, person who's mentally, who deals with, you don't want to say mentally ill, because the other R word. You want to say a person with a mental illness or a person with a developmental disability. Um, same thing with a person who is uh, has a disability um, or is living with diabetes. You want to leave out with the fact that people are people and that leads with their humanity first and not what is afflicting or what a person is living with or their experiences. And these are the ways we ask that you connect with us, email, website, our social medias, and to support our work, and also volunteering. So as we get into our panel, um, want to make one quick announcement. Tabitha Tremell will not be able to join us today, um, but she did submit some information um, that is very relevant and pertinent. And even though she wasn't able to attend, I did ask her to send some stuff. I wanted to make sure to highlight the work that she does because she works with women, um, her organization uh, works with primarily with women who are returning home, but mostly um, women who are either in recovery um, or mothers who are dealing with a lot of challenges and all of them are formerly incarcerated. But she also does a lot, a lot of advocacy around mental health um, and recovery. And so we wanted to make sure that we um, highlighted some of those as well. So today we have Chanel Haley from Transaction Georgia. Um, Transaction Georgia is a division of Georgia Equality. It is to build relationships within the transgender community with focus of building leadership and independence, to build relationships in business and corporate environments that may have little or no LGBTQ background and experience by providing training on transgender inclusive policies, to build relationships with legislative policymakers and advocate for laws and policies that include gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation, and expanding trans awareness through visibility and advocacy. Next, we have Denny Chan, who is an attorney and a managing director at Justice and Aging, which is a national organization that focuses on advancing justice for older Americans in the main areas of healthcare, economic security, and litigation. And then, uh, last, I mean, we have um, Pete Privateer from Restore Georgia, which is a membership organization that serves as a collective voice for those impacted by sexual offense laws in the state of Georgia. Their, their main focuses are to connect Georgians impacted by the registry and their loved ones to networking, to networking and registrant friendly resources by way of their monthly virtual fearless meetings monitor proposed legislative changes and advocate by testifying before committees considering changes to sexual offense legislation. And last but certainly not least is Shaniqua Bonvillian. She is a community outreach and care navigator at Mercy Care. And what she does there is awesome and amazing. A lot of her pop, her clientele are individuals, are people who are have housing instability, who are older. And she is coming at it from a different perspective as a child um, of an um, of an formerly incarcerated person. So she'd be given her experiences with how as a child, how she had to witness uh, the challenges to reentry that her uh, parents had to endure. So we'd like to thank you all so very much for joining us. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so very much for joining us. I love your graphics. Right. Huh? I was saying, I love what yeah, the graphics you'd be making on the flyers. Like, like, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. So, again, want to talk that we've um, talked about um, what we're going to do is have an opportunity for each panelist to just give a little overview of what they do at their organization. Um, they're going to take a little time to tell you what they do. And um, we're going to start off with Chanel, Miss Chanel Haley, the beautiful Miss Chanel Haley. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Chanel Haley. I'm the Director of Education and Community Engagement at Georgia Equality. I'm in year nine. So my actually role has changed, you know, from, you know, being the first trans person hired here um, to where I am now, where it was only about working with the transgender community. What I do now more is, is actually way more broad. I travel around the state of Georgia and I do educate around policies and laws that we are lacking. So um, because we don't have state protections for the LGBTQ plus community, nor, nor anyone else, any other community, people don't realize that we don't have state protections for any um, civil protections here in Georgia. Uh, we're one of three states, by the way. And so to educate that, talk to, work with politicians, municipalities, that are running for office or that become elected office so that we will have these protections in certain cities and counties throughout the state of Georgia. Because if we can't get it statewide, then we will um, get it county by county, municipal by municipal. Well, there's that. Um, I also do, we also do voter registration to make sure that everybody, you know, voice gets counted when it comes to um, registering the vote. And then, um, of course, getting the vote out, as well as the other side of organization is we do endorsements. So we always try to make sure that there is fair minded individuals that are elected. So in relation to today, though, I also do a lot of work when it comes to law enforcement. So whether it is me doing um, um, humility trainings with um, cadets in um, working through to become um, law enforcement or um, going into the actual two weeks ago, I was with the Federal um, Bureau of Prisons with their administrative office about inclusion there. And then um, I've been inside the actual federal prison doing that. I was um, at Dismiss um, Charities, which is a transitional housing um, in Macon. And then I have a standing meeting that I meet with um, every two months with the FBI. And this is um, a community uh, partnership group. And, you know, anybody on this call actually can join that, um, that, that meeting that we have. It's about building partnerships um, about safety, for communities that FBI can alert us to and give us tips on. And we can also tell them where we see there is um, deficiencies with what they do. And I'm gonna stop there because I can keep going, but y'all y'all got the picture. Thank you so very much, Chanel. I appreciate that. And we will now go with uh, Denny. Hi, hey everyone. Thank you so much. Um, I want to give a big thank you to the folks at New Life Second Chance for inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, my name is Denny Chan. I am the Managing Director for Equity Advocacy at an organization called Justice and Aging. Um, in the intro, it was mentioned we're a national legal advocacy organization, um, and our mission is to use the power of law to advance equity and fight um, senior poverty on behalf of individuals, uh, older adults who are low income. Um, unlike some of the other organizations on this panel, we're both a national organization and we don't provide direct services. So I don't have a caseload of um, older adults who I'm working with every day. Um, instead, we do systems change work. We uh, fight to change policy. And when we don't change policy or when there's a legal hook, we will also bring lawsuits on behalf of low-income older adults. Um, those are usually cases that are what we call impact litigation. So it's on behalf of a large group of low-income older adults. Um, we have several focus areas in terms of our programs, including health and long-term services and supports, economic security, elder rights and elder justice, and then a growing amount of work around equity and ensuring that all of our programs are centering equity. Um, specific to our conversation today, and I should also mention I'm joining you all from, from California. Um, so specific to our conversation today, you know, about three years ago, we launched a project to eliminate barriers for older adults leaving carceral settings and reentering communities, um, focusing specifically on the supports that they need to transition well in those communities, as well as advocating for changes to law and policy. I think what we've observed in our short time in this space is that our expertise around Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, SSI, all those programs that keep older adults happy, healthy, and at home, um, they really largely ignore um, people who are leaving carceral settings. 
um, they're not thought of. And so the way I think about it is that our work in this project focused on older adults um, re-entering community is fighting a double invisibility. Um, as a result of ageism, older adults are not commonly thought of or they're disregarded. Um, and as a result of the ways in which the criminal legal system works, um, people involved criminal, you know, criminal, those involved with the criminal legal system are often also not thought of. And so people don't think at that intersection of people who are older leaving this system. Um, and that means that as a result, our policies are not really thinking about those people. Um, and to give you sort of a concrete example, and we'll talk more about this in the Q&A, but to give you a concrete example, um, the way that Medicare, um, so this is the program that provides health care to individuals who are 65 and older, as well as people with a disability, the way that Medicare works is that um, when you become 65, you get Part A and Part B, those inpatient, outpatient health care coverage. Um, this is sort of a really, really high level overview. Um, but the issue is that the Medicare custody definition extends to people who are living in the community. Those are people who are on supervised release or in halfway homes and halfway houses. And that is actually a barrier to older adults who are leaving um, prison and jail to sign up for Medicare. Um, even though the, there was a creation of a special enrollment period um, that would allow people to enroll, the definition of custody was so broad that it prevented people from enrolling. Um, this definition is specific to Medicare. So when I said that there's a double invisibility and that the policymakers aren't thinking about older adults as people leaving partial settings, um, that's specifically true in the Medicare case. Um, this definition is different from the one that the Social Security Administration uses. It's different from the one that Medicaid uses. And what we heard from people was that this definition actually resulted in delayed access to care. People were delaying chemo treatment. People were delaying cardiac surgery because their Medicare was in limbo and they had no other way to get healthcare coverage. Um, so we've been doing a lot of advocacy on this, what we're calling the Medicare custody definition. We wrote to CMS back in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services back in January. We met with agency officials. Um, I'm really happy that this panel is happening today because just last week, CMS announced a proposed rule that would change the custody definition um, to make it consistent with SSA and Medicaid and ultimately allow people who are leaving carceral settings, older adults who are eligible for Medicare to successfully take advantage of the special enrollment period and enroll in Medicare to get the coverage that they need for their health care. Um, so I know there's going to be a bunch more questions later, but I thought that was a really concrete example of the ways in which our policy work is really trying to eliminate barriers for older adults who are leaving carceral settings. Thanks again Thank for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And actually, you know, you, it, that's also a population that we often forget about, you know, and it's really sad because all of us are going to be, whether we're formally incarcerated or not, all of us are going to have to get to that very vulnerable age. And it's just really, really sad um, the way folks are treated inside and out. So I'm going to shut up. Um, we're going to go ahead and go with Shanique because it's really upsetting to me um, to see how it worked. And because of the work that I do at my day job at Southern Center for Human Rights, where we're getting a lot of folks out um, after serving 30, 40, 50 years in prison. And they're in their 60s and their 70s and really struggling with getting the benefits that they need. And some of these folks, you know, it's, it's not right. So we're going to go ahead and go to Shaniqua and we're going to say Pete, because Pete has a presentation. So Shaniqua, tell us a little bit about what you do at Mercy Care. So um, I do street medicine outreach. So, which means I provide services on site to clients um, who are experiencing homelessness or, um, We'll generally work with the homeless population, but in our clinic, we do uh, service individuals who are housed as well. Um, so basically, I'm a case manager, um, but I like to simplify it because it makes me feel really good about it because I have the case manager brain. <laughs> so it's a lot of work, but um, we provide housing resources. Um, we also provide the medical care, so that includes mental health and um, substance. We have subs. We have peer support specialists, and we also have um, 
nurse practitioner that goes out with us, a registered nurse that comes out with us. Um, we have a mental health, um, behavioral health nurse practitioner that currently goes out with us as well. So um, in regards to working with populations, we do see a lot of older because I, we are in the Atlanta area. Um, and definitely we run across a lot of trans individuals who don't get the you know help they really do need. Um, as far as because they get discriminated, but also um, I think the biggest part of our population are people who are formerly incarcerated, and that makes a huge difference. That's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of um, other issues that can't really be resolved, so that it's a barrier to housing and stuff like that. So we work with our clients in regards to getting those things resolved. That, that can include going to court with them, that can include um, advocating for them in any kind of way for housing. Um, but we are medical first. So um, that's kind of that's kind of what I got. Um, but when it comes to you know my personal life, um, I have had a parent in incarcerated. They, it was a little, I actually didn't know until I got older. So it was really interesting. Um, um, not really interesting, but just very different to learn. Um, and it's another reason why I don't believe in child support. So um, having my parent arrested for that, um, that was a little hard to watch because during that time, um, I used, my father used to have income. And so when, you split the have to split the bill at some point. You realize, like, hey, uh, you know, we started struggling. My mom had three kids, um, and you know, she worked a defect case manager, so they weren't getting paid a lot, but were overworked, of course. So relied on a lot of family help during that time, um, but that's kind of what we got. And then I have a justice impacted brother, so that has been our newest barrier, but we are working together to help resolve that. Well, thank you so very much, Shaniqua. And Shaniqua is also a member of our board of directors, very valuable asset to our team. And we are always grateful and gracious to have her expertise and just her willingness to support the clients that we serve. So we really, really appreciate it. And so finally we have Pete Privateer who is a board director with Restore Georgia. He has a few slides that he wants to share with us. And don't worry, again, like I said, these uh, slides will also go out to everybody. If he talks super fast like I do, you will definitely get them. And then we'll go into a little round robin um, of some questions for about 30 minutes, and then that'll give us 30, 45 minutes. And then for about the last 15 minutes, we'll have Q&A. All right, Pete, so if you want, you can go ahead and start sharing your screen. Okay. Um... Okay, hopefully. Let me, uh, yeah, thank uh, you, Alicia, for uh, putting this together. Really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, um, all right, uh, let me just find the right buttons here. Um, I think it's that top one that says slide. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, at any rate. Um, so yeah, I'm Pete, a uh, privateer. I'm, uh, I am a person forced to register uh, in the state of Georgia, and I'm also a board member of Restore Georgia. Restore Georgia is the local Georgia affiliate uh, of the National Association for Rational Sex Offense Laws, um, and we work to uh, provide resources for those that are forced to register or dealing with the uh, registry in Georgia. Uh, as well as uh, advocacy and uh, uh, advocating for rational laws um, uh, in, in uh, the state legislature. Um, so uh, there are a lot of challenges for uh, persons forced to register, those leaving uh, prison and forced to be on the Georgia Sex Offender Registry. Uh, there are over 25,000 people on the registry in Georgia right now, and that does include those that are that are uh, currently incarcerated. 
Um, the problems, the issues and challenges uh, deal with uh, those that are under supervision, uh, finding housing, employment, complying with all the uh, registry uh, requirements, travel, family dynamics, and societal bias. Um, so, for example, uh, supervision uh, uh, is it's, uh, crimes that are, are uh, sex-based crimes are imposed special conditions of parole or probation that uh, I don't think any other class of crime uh, has to deal with. Um, so you may have your access to the internet or social media, either restricted, blocked, or, or, or monitored, weekly mandatory programs, which cost a lot of money that people coming out of prison don't have. Uh, and the treatment programs are really just uh, another way for the state to supervise you. Uh, biannual polygraph examinations, again, uh, another way to uh, supervise you. Uh, curfews, uh, travel, uh, and uh, another thing that people realize is that their personal associations like dating have to be monitored and approved. Um, the housing is probably the biggest challenge that P P PFRs face uh, when leaving prison. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a, quite a few people in prison that could get out early, but can't because they have no place to uh, parole to. Um, you cannot live within a thousand foot uh, of schools, churches, child care facilities, parks, swimming pools, or the generic places where children gather. Um, so that means that virtually all apartments, boarding homes, extended stay hotels, homeless shelters are not compliant, um, forcing people to go to rural areas or uh, uh, private homes or uh, uh, trailer parks are a popular uh, uh, alternative there. Um, so, uh, and your employment is also facing this very same restriction. Uh, so you can't work uh, within a thousand feet of those locations. And by the way, that's property line to property line as the crow flies. And uh, only the sheriff's department uh, gets to determine what is or is not compliant. Um, complying with the registry itself uh, is a burden uh, and a real challenge. You have to re register all the places where you sleep any residences, your motor vehicles, including maybe your spouse's or girlfriend or your roommate's motor vehicle, uh, uh, schools that you attend, where you work, your telephone numbers, that sort of thing. Any change has to be supplied to the sheriff's office within 72 hours of the change in person, by the way, in most, most jurisdictions, except if you change uh, your residence, you have to provide that 72 hours prior to uh, uh, the new residents. And not updating this information uh, is uh, punishable as another felony uh, called failure to register, uh, chargeable by one to 10 years. And um, it's also considered another sex crime, believe it or not. Um, travel, uh, if you wanna travel in another state, that's a patchwork of rules. And if you don't uh, know, where, you know the exact rules of where you're going, you can wind up being on the registry in another state. And then if you want to go international, well, that's that's a real problem. Uh, your passport's going to be marked. Um, you've got to notify the sheriff's office within 21 days of your journey. And um, a lot of the, of the world is off limits uh, to you. Uh, and uh, finally, dynamics are also impacted in ways that uh, other uh, classes of crimes are not impacted. Uh, PFRs may not be able to live with their children or other minors, uh, like grandchildren or stepchildren and things like that. Um, some PFRs may not have any contact with their children or grandchildren without super, uh, uh, an approved supervisor. Uh, and then most PFRs cannot attend their child's school functions, extracurricular activities, or sporting events, which makes it very difficult to be a parent, or in my case, a grandparent. Um, and then societal bias. Uh, the registries work as a, you know, public pillory, uh, shaming people by putting your mugshot, your crime, uh, and all your personal information on the web or in some jurisdictions, other media can be used. Some places have tried to put so signs in, in your yard 
at Halloween that has been fought by uh, Narsal and we've won those battles, but they keep trying it every, every so often. And finally, this, the misconceptions, every SO is a predator, is a very big one, you know, and, and they're, you know, P PFRs are going to snatch children off the street, which is not true. Most uh, uh, sex crimes are committed by people that the victim knows. Uh, recidivism, recidivism for uh, uh, this type of uh, offense is, is frighteningly high. That was a quote from the last Supreme Court decision, which uh, ruled in favor of registries uh, nationwide. Uh, that is not true. Uh, 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 sexually oriented crimes, uh, the lowest recidivism rate of any other crime with the exception of murder. Uh, SOs can't control their urges and can't be cured. Absolutely not true. You know, most uh, people uh, that are PFRs uh, go on to live uh, normal, healthy lives. Most, uh, and again, uh, same thing about reoffense. So what can we do? Uh, we can see PFRs as people first. Uh, we can work with our legislatures and advocate for advocate for evidence-based laws that don't waste money. We, we can help uh, make compliant housing available and compliant employment available. Uh, we can also educate others and speak out against societal bias and discrimination. Uh, and I, uh, we can also join Restore Georgia at RestoreGeorgia.org, and I'll drop the link in the chat as well as the uh, uh, NARSOL organization. Uh, uh, both are doing uh, heroic work on this front, uh, combating this uh, uh, the discrimination that's out there. And that's, uh, that's about it. I'll stop sharing at this point. Well, you did amazing, Pete. You did really, really good. And uh, you were concerned that you weren't gonna get through it in that little bit of shorter time. You did really good. And uh, uh -huh. we really appreciate you. And Pete is going to send me that uh, those the slide so we can make sure we get that information to you all as well. So don't worry about trying to scramble. Um, but I am really mm -hmm. big on statistics. Um, I am also a member of Restore Georgia. I am the board chair of Restore Georgia. Um, I am not a person who is forced to register, but I feel that wrong is wrong. Discrimination is discrimination. And um, I want to just give you just a little few stats that Pete talked about. And then we're going to move on to our questions. To be truthful, if you just really want to know what the apples are, over 90% of sexual assault victims knew their attacker, which literally obliterates the fear of stranger danger, which also has caused a lot of children, me, myself included, who was molested as a child, who was always told about stranger danger. So I never reported when family members molested me because I knew my family members. So stranger danger is a very, very harmful thing to keep telling people about stranger danger when actually 90% 90, 90 of people who are molested and raped are done by people they know, their teachers, their family members, their own loved ones, people who we willingly hand our children over to every day. Okay, 95% of sexual offenses are committed by people who are not, repeat that, people who are not on the registry. So we spend so much time, we spend so much money monitoring people when we need to be worried about the folks who ain't been caught yet, okay? Less than three, and this is the biggest, biggest fear monger that you will hear folks saying about folks on the registry, they're dangerous, they're an absolute threat. Of all of the crimes that are committed in the United States, there are over, overwhelmingly 70% of people who commit things like murder, armed robbery, burglary, and assault have a 70% recidivism rate. Do you hear me? People who break in your house, in your cars, and kill you and steal have a 70% recidivism rate. People who are on the registry have less than a 3.3% recidivism rate. So we have to also wonder what it is that we are so afraid of. And we're going to get into it um, as we get ready to get into our question. But a lot of you may not know that there are children as young as eight years old on the registry. And that's right here in Georgia, autism. You can be slapped being on the registry for almost anything. Um, 
some I, I can tell you some of the stories. I mean, an actual married family who's on the registry, a husband and wife because they got they were having sex too loud. Um, uh, a you know autistic yo eight yo, four two fourteen yos who are on the registry for assaulting each other, but are also each other's victims. I mean, it's just random. You get the registry, you get the registry, you get the. It is absolutely ridiculous. But regardless of what people are doing, everybody deserves the opportunity to work, to have housing, to have access to medical care and health care and the mental health stuff they need. Because without those, nobody can really expect laws to be obeyed and we'd be in chaos. So we wouldn't have a lot of the challenges that we have if people, if we could really just get over the issues of societal biases and discrimination. So we're gonna go ahead and jump into our question of, oh, and I just got out of meeting today. I'm gonna tell you this and we're gonna go to the next question with um, Chanel and then Shaniqua. Do you know that in five states, it used to be six, but in five states, you are, you can be put on the sex registry for having HIV and AIDS. Now, how stupid is that? So we want to be mindful. We got to be careful when we're saying, let's isolate these people, isolate these people, isolate these people, because you know what? One day you might be one of them folks. If you kiss a person the wrong thing or wear your shirt a little too short, or, or, or say something the wrong way, you just might be the same people that you've been ostracizing. Just imagine if they put a registry out there for all of us who have sinned, all of us who've done some things we're not happy about. We wouldn't want our names to be on those registries. So y'all got to think about that stuff too. Okay, so let's go to the first question with Miss Chanel. Um, Chanel, I noticed that on the um, Georgia Equality website, you all don't have anything that explicitly discusses reentry or criminal justice. But in your role at Transaction Georgia, what are some of the biggest reentry challenges that you have seen or you've personally experienced by trans men and women? By far, the number one is definitely housing. Um, as you've heard repeated today, it's that when a person is released, there is housing um, insecurities that take place. So whether it is when they're coming directly out of the prison, or directly out of the jail, or even out of a transitional um, housing, um, there is usually an issue around that. You're coupling the fact that family is judgmental around any person that has had injustice impacted However, when you then add on the fact about their um, transition-related um, gender identity, then that also causes another barrier for them that many times that they had zero support when they were incarcerated. And so that support also is not available when they get out. And then there's very few then organizations that will allow because we're many times a church group or a religion-based organization will step in to help out, you know, with emergency housing or, you know, um, food, um, you know, getting somebody started, then there usually is an issue also where they won't help based upon the religion of not wanting to help a person that um, identifies as transgender. And I had a friend that um, when they moved here, um, this was years ago, but um, they are a member of NA. Very, very, very dedicated, like for the last... 20 years, they've been, they go to all the conferences and all the meetings, they're, they're really dedicated. But they, when they moved from Philadelphia to come to Atlanta to get away from what the life they were living, they were promised and set up to be set up here by this, by this big church here in Atlanta. Well, when the church met them and learned that they were um, transgender, then they said, we don't help your kind. And so they had to start over, start up from scratch. And I think um, as when I, in my role, when I was the chair of the Human Relations Commission for the city of Atlanta, I've actually even had to um, charge a local housing organization that um, was refusing service. First, they were refusing service to the trans community, and then it got to where um, they were only charging the trans individuals going in there and not charging um, the other people that was going in for emergency service, which is... Um, that's what to do for the first 30 days. That's just awful. Thank you so much for that, Chanel. And while we're talking about churches, I have a problem with these churches. Myself, um, as I after I got out of prison, I was 
ejected from not one, not two, but church folk told me in three different churches that I was not welcome because I had a felony. And this is what the problem is. Um, we just got, I don't know if you want to call them church folks, but folks who ain't rooted in their own principle of their faith. And I think that's just awful um, because people have no problem having LGBT choir directors. You know, they're glad with them. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But some of the, the, the discrimination that just outright. And one of the challenges that we've had or seen uh, in the work here and at Restore Georgia, our churches throughout Georgia and other states randomly pulling background checks. So when you're going into a church and giving, filling out your visitation card, they're renting your name. And if they find out you got a felony, they may ask you to leave the church because I thought church was for the spiritually sick. I don't know. Maybe I'm just confused. But well, I would tell you that if you're on the, the registry, you're automatically told to not return back. It's a doc so I think that's a awful. of what is written within these doctrines because it's supposed to be about forgiveness and acceptance for all. That's what's written. So the idea that someone is saying that you can't come because of whatever you did is in direct conflict with their own scriptures that they're preaching about every Sunday. Every Sunday. They're not walking. They're not. They just talking. They're not walking the walk. All righty. So let's go to Shaniqua real quick. Um, Shaniqua, I want to ask you a question. What do you think as a child of, I know you had mentioned earlier about the child support. And also I get a lot too, because I don't really believe in child support. So I have to shut up on that sometimes. <laughs> but as a child of someone who, my mom uh, was addicted to crack for like 30 years. So I definitely dealt with her going in and out of prison. Um, and that's often a, a part of the re-entry stuff that people never really realize to talk about either the victims or the children. So as a child of a um, person who was dealing with those challenges, how did that make you feel? And what, you know, can you talk a little bit more about that challenge with that, with the child support issue? Yeah, so I personally, because I am an Aries, I will hold a grudge in a second. So I was a little mad at my mom. I always felt like, you know, he split up the family because but after like my parents split, my dad moved to Louisiana. So, um, so that was a little difficult and as well. Um, how I felt, um, if I had to name it, I was a little angry. I was bitter. I was hurt. Um, as a child, you don't understand the impact it has on you and the trauma it takes because I'm like, where is my parent? Like, where is my father? Why can't I see him? Why, you know? Um, so a lot of it was just learning how to deal with the new normal. Um, so if I, if I had to say how I felt, um, Hurt and annoyed <laughs> would be the private, probably the proper, proper way to say it. Um, I don't believe in child support for this reason um, because, you know, my dad couldn't drive to come see me my because he had to pay all these fines. Um, so once he got out, so it, it was little things like those really keep family separated. And I feel like it's all part of the, the plan they have in <laughs> government. But yeah. yes. Well, thank you so much for that. Denny, um, older Americans are increasingly arrested and incarcerated due to the aging of populations that often face criminalization, such as people who are experiencing homelessness and the aging of people in prison. Today, older Americans comprise five times as much of the prison population as they did in 1991, and the proportion of older adults in prison is projected to increase to more than 30% by 2030. Many of these older adults are also people with disabilities and are people of color, both of whom are overrepresented in the criminal legal system. Last month, Justice and Aging submitted comment on HUD's proposed rule on reducing barriers to HUD-assisted housing for those with criminal records. Can you give us an update on that proposed ruling and give us a little bit more about the link between disability, incarceration, and social exclusion when it comes to our elders inside and out? Yeah, what a great question. Um, I just put the comment letter we submitted to HUD in the chat. So if folks want to put that, you know, take that away for their review later, they are more than welcome to. Um, let me kind of take your questions in reverse order because I think it's important first to talk about who we're talking about. 
um, and then talk a bit about that common opportunity that we submitted comment on. So the first question, the, the second question you asked was really around like the link between disability, um, race, and age um, in this context of people who are leaving the car car carceral setting. Um, and I think it's important to point out that we're really talking about some strong connections between each of those various identities, and we're talking really about the same people. So just some statistics, because I know that we were talking about data earlier. Um, you had talked about how by 2030, so in just six years from now, the proportion of older adults in prison is supposed to be 30%, more than 30% of people in the system. Um, because of the ways in which disability is linked to aging and race, um, we also know that people with disabilities are disproportionately um, overrepresented in the criminal legal system. 66% of state and federal prison populations are disabled compared to only 27%. Um, so less than half of adults in the US outside of nationwide. Um, and 42%, um, so a significant minority, are people of color with disabilities. Um, older adults are also more likely to report being disabled. Either they were born with a disability or they're aged into a disability. So 50%, over 50% of people who are 55 to 64, we think of as younger older adults, are uh, report being disabled. And then 70% of people who are 65 and older report having a disability. So it's really hard in the face of this data to ignore the ways in which disability, race, um, and age are all connected, but we're talking really about the same group of people. Um, so your first question, after we talk about who, was about this comment opportunity. Um, so we the, the comment opportunity, the proposed rule that HUD um, asked for comment on, uh, that comment period just closed last month. So as you pointed out, we submitted comments. The letter is dated from June of 2024. Um, they have until they, they have as much time as they want to issue a new final rule. Um, there isn't an update as of this time, but I will say a couple of things to keep in mind. One, of course, is I think it's in their interest to issue a final rule before the potential change in administration. Um, two, there is something known as the Congressional Review Act, um, which basically means that for a certain period of months um, prior to the change in administration, Congress has the ability to scrutinize um, rules that agencies promulgated even prior to a transition. Um, so they'll want to clear, steer clear of that, um, which really doesn't give them a ton of time. Um, and then the last is that, um, you know, under this current Supreme Court, we have a court that has um, really kind of taken administrative law and the deference that agencies get um, in their promulgated rules a completely different direction. Um, so for a long time, there was something known as Chevron deference. So agencies, um, courts had to give agencies deference um, that was largely eviscerated under the Supreme Court um, in a ruling last month. So we will see, um, the only time will tell kind of how much all this holds um, in light of the changing political environment. But I guess long, long story short would be um, that it's in this administration's interest to get a final rule issued as soon as possible if they want to um, avoid issues with the Congressional Review Act. And then I think we will see kind of what happens with the future of administrative law um, Post Chevron. Thank you. Thank you so very key. Um, I wanted to ask you a question regarding um, you've already talked about the biggest challenges, so we're not going to go through that again. Um, or let me see. So, so one of, one of the things that you did talk about was one of the biggest challenges for people on the registry is obtaining housing before and after their release. A lot of people don't realize that. People have literally, if they've given you five years in prison, they can literally not release you. There are some folks right now sitting in prison that should have their parole date or they've already gotten out of their time um, three, four years ago. I don't know about y'all, but when I'm supposed to be out of prison and my time is up, I'm not talking about parole. I'm talking about your time has been served, but you're keeping me in prison because I cannot go 
if I did that and I wasn't in prison, that'd be called kidnapping. So you're literally holding these people hostage because they're on the registry and they cannot um, live in a place and there are children everywhere. Um, so I wanted to find out, um, including ending getting rid of the living restrictions and fixing the registry to only have people who are credible threats to society be on it or getting rid of it altogether, which, which regardless of what it is, what are your recommendations um, in supporting reentry efforts? for registrants so that they can acquire housing. And I know you talked about it earlier about getting rid of, you know, stereotypes, changing social biases, but I'm saying one, if you had one or two things and they said one, Pete, give me two things that right now you think would improve people being able to get housing who are PFRs, what, what, would, what would you say those would be? Yeah, well, Alicia, that's probably one of the greatest uh, barriers and a uh, few other people can, that are, are, impacted by uh, their crime or their crime the crimes that they committed I have to face this uh, I don't know of any other crime where there's a thousand foot rule where you can live in a thousand foot rule where you can work um it, it you know and, and there are uh, pe uh, people with uh, sex offense based uh, crimes uh, are disproportionately kept in prison for uh, past uh, where they uh, would ordinarily have been able to be released. And, uh, you know, having been in prison, we used to talk about something called max out. That's your maximum release date. And, you know, in theory, you can't be kept past that. Well, uh, a PFR or somebody with a sexually based offense can actually be kept past their max out date, and, and uh, uh, which is should be a crime. Um, you know, as far as what to do about the housing, one of the first things is uh, a person inside that's looking for uh, a place to live when they get out needs uh, help from an outside person. They cannot do this uh, uh, on the inside. Uh, so they either need family members that can help them to find a place or perhaps some kind of organization um, uh, uh, or institution that can that can help them. Um, you know, the just to determine, I think my wife, when I was getting to be released from prison, she submitted over 30 addresses to the sheriff's department before finding one that was compliant that, that I could parole out to. Um, and, you know, uh, you can't just look at Google Maps and tell uh, because I know one of the uh, uh, properties that we wanted to uh, move to uh, looked like it was uh, next to a, a woods. But it turned out that that woods was owned by, by the uh, Gwinnett County Public Schools. So even though there was no school there, uh, the the location was not compliant. So you you can't just tell by looking at a map. Um, so you need uh, you need help on the outside. And then you know for those that have the ability, uh, you know I know there are a lot of people that that in reentry programs that have transitional housing or housing areas, but uh, a, a lot of those, trans first of all, a lot of the transitional housing won't accept uh, PFRs. Uh, and those that would, the locations are not compliant. So we need more organizations that are working on transitional housing to uh, uh, A, make those available to PFRs and also make sure that the locations are compliant. Um, uh, so those are, I think, two things, you know, getting, making sure there's someone on the outside that can help people that are uh, uh, prior to reentry and also uh, looking for uh, organizations that can take into consideration uh, the, the proximity restrictions when it comes to both, well, both housing and jobs. Uh, uh, that, yeah. that's, that's so important. Yeah. I mean, how do you expect someone to really thrive if you're putting so many limitations on them or you being so vague with saying children, where children congregate? Children congregate yeah. everywhere. I can't get them off my front porch uh, mm -hmm. and I don't even have any kids. So these are the kind of things that we have problems with. You know, uh, you can't work, you can't school, you can't go here, you can't go there. But what do you expect people to do? And, 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 and um, you brought up a very valid point, because just like people on the registry are not... Uh, one of the biggest things that I have found in the work that I do outside of this work is that folks who are on the registry are not supposed to socialize with other folks on the registry. 
Um, it is also the same thing and is a ridiculous rule for just folks general on general state probation who are not supposed to socialize with other people on probation. This is absolutely ridiculous because those are the folks who got the resources we need. Um, right. So it's it doesn't make, it's counterproductive to tell us you cannot associate with other F words um, because those are the folks who got the job. I need to know who's hiring the people with the felonies. These are the people who got a landlord who's willing to rent to them, but then they don't want you to con to, to associate with those. So I think it hurts there's, and harms. I think you had some really good resist you had some really good um suggestions. There's um, it, we need to be more evidence-based. There are no studies anywhere that show that uh uh these proximity restrictions, this thousand foot rule does anything to protect uh uh, citizens or children in, 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 in anywhere in Georgia or anywhere else. So we, you know, there. To me, it's just ex post facto punishment, and yeah. it's not. And again, based it's in just fact. out of ignorance because there is a lot of the stuff is rooted out of ignorance. You assume that um, in some states, I'm not sure if it's Georgia or not, but some states you can actually be put on the registry for for kidnapping. So if Shanika and I got to fight, and Shanika and I got to fight, but then he moved Shanika into a different room to keep her from whooping my behind, he can technically be charged with kidnapping because he restricted her movement and he could be placed on the registry for kidnapping. So a lot of these things are charged and rooted out of fear. And as taxpayers, we should really be upset that we're wasting money and time monitoring people um, and dealing into this fear because the main question should be, we need people to work. We need people to have housing. When people work and people have housing, they pay taxes, they have money to spend into the economy, they're more productive. So um, I want to get to the medical parts of it. So Chanel, I wanted to ask you, um, what is Chanel's question? A really good question. Okay. So can you speak on the challenges that trans men and women have in accessing appropriate gender affirming medical care inside and once they're released? And yeah, we're going to leave it at that. So inside is... Um comes down to just straight out discrimination and the sense um, there's a difference between the state and federal. So in a state that particularly if it is a um, private institution, um, pro probably ran um, institution or, or state ran is a little different depending on what the state law is. But the challenges are that it is very biased in the sense that it's something that they don't feel is needed. It's not medically necessary. Mm -hmm. Whereas the federal has taken a different approach under the Obama Biden administration. Um, they have decided that um, they, they've taken the advice upon um, from PREA that it is discrimination to deny access for um, gender affirming care within um, federal prisons. Um, several states have also adopted this. And this also goes into the same thing around actually being placed where you're placed at. So that means that trans women being in, um, placed into women's prisons, trans men being placed into men's prisons. The guidelines for that is that it is based upon what the preference would be um, for that inmate, for that person um, being incarcerated Thank prior you. to the being incarcerated during the sentencing stage as well as with the um, Federal Bureau of Prisons deciding or not if this is a security risk, a safety risk, not for all parties involved. And that's usually how the determination is made. But again, that is the guidelines for federal. The states make their own up. There's a case that happened here around Ashley Diamond that was incarcerated um, here in, in Georgia and um, you know was sexually assaulted in there was denied access to gender affirming care. Then, um, you know, the information got out. The Southern Poverty Law Center took the case up. So instead of Georgia, instead of changing their policies, they just decided to release Ashley. You know, good for Ashley, right? But it also tells you that they were so concerned with and so hell-bent on wanting to keep the discrimination and keep the negative policies in place that they were the, were the let somebody go who had more time on their sentence to, to serve. They didn't want to change anything. Like, just get rid of that person and then deal with them ever again. That was the Georgia stance on this. And um, I would tell you that, unfortunately, because it's not a uniform where it stayed in jails in Georgia, that you can be at one jail 
where you will get your gender affirming care, medical care, and then at a different one in a different part of the state, and you won't get any. Mm. Um, yeah, so DeKalb, Fulton, guaranteed you will get your care, but when you start going outside those counties, then um, it's a different ballgame. There is no okay. training that's taking place with the officers there. There's no training that took place with the DA's offices. Um, they There is all of them, including those one I just named, their medical care is actually outsourced, but they are not um, keen onto who the um, the inmates are, or the people that come in there, what, what, what the backgrounds are, the populations, their lifestyles. They have no education around that. And then the further you get out, the more discriminatory, more discrimination that takes place. Now, if, I will say, I will say there's a, there is a small glimmer of hope around that. Remember what I said about the Ashley Diamond case. When you do get into more rural Georgia, those jails and prisons also will decide they also don't want their in, their transgender inmate in there either. So inmate, the chance of them getting out, um, parole, probation out is a lot higher because they feel as if they don't have the um, the education and that it is too much of a disturbance to house a transgender individual. So it depends on how you look at it. If you're that person that is, you know, somewhere in um in early county, you know, getting banged up with in, in law enforcement, it might be in your advantage that because you are trans that you won't be actually um in the jail too long because they will decide that they won't won't um house you. However, the treatment that they do is um severe. Yeah. It is severe. Yeah. It's isolation, um, which is probably the, the best, but as far as the discrimination of how they talk to you, um, the treatment of how they let people, how they let the other um, rest there treat you, how the guards are, and I can go on and on. I mean, even there's even a case here in Georgia where we have a trans woman that became a deputy sheriff who also was discriminated against from her own colleagues. And the lawsuit mm. happened. She's won the lawsuit. She is still a deputy sheriff, but just so you know, if they're treating their own staff and members that way, how they would also treat those that are um, in, inside the jails and prisons. That's awful. Um, thank you so much for that. And for the sake of time, Denny, I hate to do it to you, but I want to talk about it. We're not even going to talk about voting as an issue with elder people because that's a big challenge, especially with older folks and disabled folks. But I will send that in the email um, I get that all the time. And that was one of the reasons why a lot of times I did not want to vote because I'm also disabled. It makes a challenge. So I know it's even harder for older folks. But I do know that laws are supposed, each state is supposed to have something in place uh, to make accommodations for you, whether you're able to sit down, jump it in the front of the line, those type of things. So I'll make sure I send you that link to that information for here in Georgia that has special accommodations for elders and folks with disabilities. Um, but Denny, I'm going to combine a question because I think it's very important. The issues are about housing and the issues are about accessing um, health care. Um, the first one really, really quick is, can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, the issue of making sure that older returning citizens have access to Social Security benefits? I'm thinking that was what I was trying to ask you about earlier was the, what is that? The where they can get the insurance even past enrollment period. Uh, a lot of folks don't know that when you get out of prison, you are really eligible with getting Medicare and your Medicaid. Um, can you talk to those folks who um, are on the call who really want to know how they can get it? Because a lot of folks are being denied for that as well as food stamps, but specifically about this Medicare enrollment period and what they can do with that. And then I'll follow up with another quick one about hood housing. Yeah, so the good news is for the longest time, um, it was really hard for people who were leaving prison and jail to get back on Medicare. And we all know that, as I explained before, Medicare is that program that helps um, people with health care who are 65 and older or have a qualifying disability. Um, because the way that Medicare works is you have to sign up at a certain period of time. And if you don't sign up within that window, then you get hit with what's called a late enrollment penalty. So both people who were leaving prison and jail might miss that window. Um, and then there was a financial disincentive to enroll because when they would enroll, they would have um, be hit with this late enrollment penalty. Um, so starting early in 2023, um, under the Biden-Harris administration, 
uh, CMS actually changed or allowed for what's known as a special enrollment period, um, what we call in the policy world SEP for short, that basically says if you're leaving a carceral setting, you get a special window um, during which you can enroll in Medicare without having to pay that late enrollment penalty. Um, what I explained before was that there were issues, though, because of Medicare's custody definition from people actually actualizing that window um, in time. But the good news is, as a rule of policy, if you're leaving a carceral setting and you're eligible for Medicare, you are entitled to a special enrollment period. I know there were a number of people who in the chat said that they're working with a lot of older adults who are re-entering the community. Um, we would love to hear from you all about how this special enrollment period is or isn't working um, so that we can make sure that it's in place and is working for people who are, who are leaving the system. Thank you so much. And then it's going to be your last question for this day, Denny, before we get into the Q&A real quick, take a few questions. I wanted to ask the question about the HUD housing, about housing discriminations is one of the biggest barriers that older adults with criminal records face. Now, um, the FHA applies to most private and subsidized housing and prohibits housing discrimination based on several protected characteristics, which we all know about the protected class or the race, color, religion, national origin, and sex, including gender identity and sexual orientation, disability, and familiar status. So although having a criminal record is not a federally protected class, can you tell us on, can you tell us how housing providers may still violate the FHA that, that may largely include people with criminal records? Yeah, so I know this is supposed to be a short answer. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of outline three ways in which this discrimination occurs and then drop in the chat a link to a fact sheet that we released last year um, that walks through this in more detail. And I know that there was someone in particular who has already emailed me saying that they see this come up a lot in assisted living. Um, and so I would encourage that person to look through the fact sheet and then reach out for more help if they if they want. But basically there's three ways under the Fair Housing Act in which this type of discrimination um, against someone with a criminal record could potentially be problematic and violate the Fair Housing Act. One is if there was disparate treatment. So in other words, what we call intentional discrimination, um, that, is a pretty high bar to prove legally because you have to get into the mindset of the person making the decision um, to show that there was some sort of proof there was discrimination. That person acted with animus to discriminate specifically on the basis of a protected characteristic. Um, two, which is a little more interesting, is that there's a facially neutral policy, um, but that it disproportionately hurts a particular group of people, and that's known as disparate impact. Um, and then the third is specifically around refusals of public housing authorities to make accommodations for um, cases in which a criminal history is linked to a disability. Um, so I think there's oftentimes a misconception that, you know, discrimination against people with a criminal record is okay, it's legal, it's much more complicated and nuanced depending on the set of facts. Um, oftentimes there's an individualized review that is that is required. So I'd encourage folks who are seeing this come up with um, their clients and people they're working with to go read that fact sheet, the link for which I dropped in the chat, and then feel free to reach out to Justice Naging for more technical assistance. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Denny. And before we get ready to go to our Q&A, I'm going to ask Shaniqua a question, and then we'll close out with Chanel's last question. Janiqua, in your work that you do at Mercy Care, I imagine because you it is based on based on income and a lot of you may see a lot of unsheltered people that come in. Um, what is your biggest challenge when y'all are trying to get those individuals health care? Is the ID required or what do you all do y'all just do work or do y'all actually connect them to some of the resources that they need? So it can go a few ways. So at Mercy Care, we do not charge um, people who are um, who don't have income. We are are experiencing homelessness, so we are a free clinic. Um, when it comes to getting individuals 
medical care that's, you know, we come to them, that's free of charge. Um, if it's something that requires a specialist, we of course use outside resources such as Grady, um, who do, do work with, and I hate the word indigent, but indigent people. <laughs> um, so um, that's one way. Um, I think I'm forgetting your second part of your question as well. No, I was just asking, you know, about the ID. Is the ID a normally a barrier? Because most of the time you have to come in. How do I know if you're not, you know, you are the person that you are when you're dealing with medical records. So I didn't know if ID was a barrier for that. Not one that um, you don't need an ID to come to Mercy Care. Um, ideally, we would love if you know your social security number so we can link your files or with any outside providers if you if they consent. But ID is not a barrier actually with Mercy Care. Okay, thank you so very much. And our last question before we open up the Q&A is for the lovely Chanel. Chanel, are there currently any laws in Georgia or in the country that are specific to incarcerated transgender people? So I actually already answered this for you. Oh, you did? I combined in the last one. Yeah, this is the, what I was talking about when it came to um, what Priya recommended in the Federal Bureau of Prisons about um, placement as well as um providing uh, medical care inside. That's what we got. That's all it is. It's uh, okay. it's federal um, and the states then do their own thing. So whereas in California, the, your answer would be yes, but in Georgia, the answer would be no. Okay. All right. So I think I also want to address, and this can, anybody can take this, Janelle, anybody before we open it up, because it was one of the questions that was actually asked. One of the challenges I have seen with wanting to start housing here in Georgia, uh, New Life has been uh, having a housing program for the past three years um, with trying to actually start housing for individuals who are returning. And unlike a lot of folks who are starting housing, who've never been to jail, charging these exorbitant amount of amounts, we specifically wanted to be able to provide housing for special populations, people who are actually older, over the ages of 60, individuals who are trans and individuals who are on the registry. One of the biggest challenges that we find from the actual cities is that once they find out that you are actually, and you don't even have to tell them they're on the registry, you don't have to tell them that you can just mention the fact that you're trying to open some housing for individuals with a criminal record. And they're like, no, they completely shut it down. Um, what is it that can be done for folks to be able to get what we need to be able to provide housing because that is a big challenge. I mean, all of these empty schools around here, all these empty hospitals that are closing, it makes no sense to be spending all of this money. I think New York and California, they spent up to $35,000, $40,000 on one person. Um, depending how old you are, you could be spending $6,000 a month on an individual that has HIV and AIDS, who's, who has diabetes, or who's older. And these are things that you could be alleviating this by providing housing. What, um, Denny, I know probably in your work or Chanel and y'all's work and Pete's work and for the folks who are on the call who are asking, how can you get around that? I mean, are cities legally able to say, and which is what we get all the time, is no, we're not going to approve any housing where there's more than one person with a felony in that same home. Isn't that a form of discrimination or I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Georgia is, protects, um, landlords a lot better than they do the actual tenants. So there's, there's your number one problem there. Um, there's that. The other side of it is, is that government does not see, have, does not think there's an interest in providing um, housing. So where we have, like in the city of Atlanta, there is the, the, land, the land bank authority so they own, they have several properties that they actually initially want other people to take over, but they're strategic about who it is that, that they give it to or sell it to at a very cheap price. Okay. Okay. All righty. Well, we'll open it up for um, questions. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. I'm trying to go down the little list. Um trying to go down this list. But if you have a, feel free to come off mute if you have a question for Shaniqua, Pete, Denny, or Chanel. Um, Tabitha Tremel wasn't able to make it, um, but she did have uh, some input about 
she works with women. And while you all are getting your question in, I wanted to just um, be able to highlight that in that space to talk about women who are having problems with coming home, particularly women. Um, one of the biggest challenges for me, uh, I had kids that I was raising when I got locked up. So my one of my biggest challenges is trying to get your children back um, and make it so difficult to do that. Um, but when I asked, um, I asked Tabitha about some of the challenges and that was one of the, the issues that she asked was about um, the biggest challenges to was to housing and medicine stabilization as most people are not, or they're unsheltered and they're not aware of any resources. And then again, um, having housing with a criminal conviction makes it hard for a woman to obtain housing which is a, a requirement in order to get custody for your kids back. Um, and so the system offers very few resources for mothers returning home from incarceration, which makes reunification almost impossible. Um, and so one of the things I wanted to uplift is we are in a state that will criminalize women for wanting to have abortions, talk about how we love the kids, but we can look on the news at any point in time and hear about how our school system is refusing to feed children free lunches and make them what they say, grilled cheese sandwiches and milk. Um, but we love the kids now, or we're talking about how much we love the kids and we want everybody to uh, not have autonomy over their own body. But what we have no problem with um, is denying a man or a woman housing simply because they have a felony or they may be on the registry, but completely overlook the fact that it never dawns on them that when you're denying mama and daddy housing, you're also denying children housing. And I don't see how it can be so comfortable for them to see families sleeping under bridges. I mean, I'm talking about people with children that are in diapers simply because you have denied their mom and their dad housing. Um, and so those are things we also need to be thinking about as well. Shaniqua, I see your hand up. Go ahead. So it's actually um, interesting that you mentioned this. Um, I just found out some information that they are developing new programs with DFACs to assist um, that reunification aspect. So people who are on a case plan for reunification, they are actually working with them to get housing yeah. in Atlanta. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. So we have um, Curtis from the Incarcerated. Um, Pete, if you can, somebody asked about their volunteer opportunities with Restore Georgia. Um, if you want to answer that, we really don't have too much to do, but if you want to answer that, you can and just drop the link um, to the website so folks can do that. Okay. Yeah, um, there's a place on the website when you register uh, 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 to indicate that you're interested in uh, uh, volunteer opportunities. Okay. And I'll make sure I send that link. All the information from all of the presenters, the links that they drop, how to connect with them will definitely be in the follow-up email. And I will do my best to try to get it out to you all. Um, we're over here at New Life between all of us. We are all volunteer who work two and three and 50 lab jobs. So we are doing our very best and we often sell fun things. We'll be having an event this Saturday where we're going to be giving out cash gift cards and guess what? That comes out of our pockets. So we are very working hard. So just be a little bit patient with us. Um, we're going to try to get that out to you. And we're always in need of volunteers as well to help with just social media and all kinds of stuff as well as donate. Uh, I'll be 70 in November and I'm on the registry. My court order says I'm able to be on it for seven years from date of conviction. Will I be removed automatically? Also, because I'm disabled, I'm supposed to be able to get off probation after two years. I've never heard about that. But not if I'm on the registry, which is ridiculous. So there's two sets of rules. So people who are over 70 can get off probation after two years because of their age. But if you're on the registry, but you're still, oh, I mean, you, it doesn't make any sense. When I get off the registry, will I be able to get off probation? Maybe that question may go to you, Denny, since you're an attorney, or maybe Pete. Denny, and he's an elder, so anybody able oh. to chime in on that? If not, we'll make sure we... Oh, okay, go ahead, Pete. What was the question, Alicia? I'm sorry, I was The question you. says, I'll be 70 in November. I'm on the registry. My court order says I'm to be on it for seven years from the date of conviction. Will I be removed automatically? Let's answer that one first. Uh, that's a good... I, I, I'm, I, 
Georgia is are you removed from the registry time. automatically, like you are from probation? Not no. to my knowledge. Uh, it, Georgia's lifetime registry, you can get off the registry through after you've served probation three years. Well, now it's, uh, I'm sorry, five years after the, the end of your probation. Uh, you can apply to be taken off the registry, but it, it is not automatic. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, that's why I say it sounds like he got some bad information. Okay, also or because it, I'm disabled. Another state. Yeah. Another state also might because have different I, rules, but not in Georgia. Okay. Also because I'm disabled, I'm supposed to be able to get off probation after two years, but that does not apply because he's on the registry. When I get off the registry, will I be able to get off probation? No, it's the other way around. You you need to get off probation. You cannot be taken off the registry if you're still on probation. You must complete all uh, supervised release, uh, including probation, uh, and then you can apply to be taken off the registry uh, if your crime was committed before July 1st of 2024. Uh, they did change the law, the new law into effect uh, July 1st, 2024, uh, which requires you to wait five years after you completed probation. But if your crime was committed before that uh, July 1st of 2024, uh, once you come off probation, you can apply to be taken off to registry if you are a level one uh, PFR, okay? Uh, so, yeah, if you're level two or level three, um, you you have to get your level, you'd have to be re-leveled to a level one in order to apply to be taken off the registry. Okay. And... Um... Let me see if we have one more question because I want to let you all know about an upcoming event. I'm going to ask Galen to drop that information since I see him on the call. Um, I'm new to Georgia. I'll make sure we get your information. Does anyone have an, an understanding of how the Thor listing is compiled? Who actually controls the list and if there are updates to adding new providers of housing and moving programs no longer in existence? I'm not sure that, Mr. Franklin. We've used it, but of course, I verify everything. Um, before we send our uh, things out to our clients. Um, some, there are some things that are old. I don't think they actually have anybody who looks at that updated list because there's supposedly supposed to be a list on the Thor list of people who open who open housing uh, for individuals who have criminal records um, or those who are on the registry. Um, and then you may call it, the numbers don't work or the websites, you know, you get that 404 error or they'll say, I don't know why we're on that list. We don't take people on the registry. Um, so, but any information that we send out from New Life, our organization is about us for us organization. We're not going to send anything out that's not open to individuals who are impacted by a record. Um, and so I can look and contact a friend of mine who's there um, and see if we can, I can get that question answered for you. And on the date... I want to let you all know Galen dropped it in the chat. I'm going to let you talk in one minute, Chanel. He dropped it in the chat. So right now on the date is the 23rd Annual State Criminal Justice Network Conference by NACTO, which is the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. It is a virtual conference from August 14th through the 15th. Um, I will be on one of the panels. Um, and you can register online. It is a free live virtual event. And I'll make sure I send this information as well. Um, but there are going to be some of the workshops and topics are going to be reflecting on the past year, envisioning ahead, shape, uh, shaping public opinion and policy uh, around the registry, uh, reframing the discourse, shifting perspectives. Um, another one is statutory innovations for justice involved veterans. So I'll make sure I send this information to you all as well, but the link has been dropped in the chat and that's for August 14th and 15th. So if you all can join um, us for that as well, please do that. And Chanel, I think you want to give us some clarification. No, I was gonna say that um, they, the the state pardons, um, Board of Pardons and Parole is taking um, ownership of the Thor list. So that is whom you would want to reach out to. Um, their executive director, not one of the, not one of the, um, the not one of the commissioners, but their executive director would be over that staff that compiles that list. Okay. Well, thank you so very much. So just to sum some few things up before we go, Denny, it is technically, um, I know you do a lot of advocacy with folks with 
economic justice. So on a roundabout, is it discrimination or is it legal to discriminate us from housing, employment, Medicare, and our social security benefits when you're older or you, or you have a criminal record? Um, so I, I think it was during the housing portion where I said there's a misconception that people are um, are not entitled to housing because of their criminal record. And so um, that often is a misconception. And I would say, depending on, this is a very lawyer-like answer, but it would depend on the facts. Um, but don't assume that just because you have a criminal record that you are not entitled to services. Um, there's often an individualized inquiry that... Um, makes it much more complicated. So don't don't hold yourself out um, and make sure to reach out to Justice Naging. I put my email in the chat um, to learn more. All righty. And as a reminder, we have about three more events uh, for this month. We have one coming up this Saturday, the 20th. We will be in Cabbage Town. It is free. We're going to be giving dinner for up to 35 people, cash giveaways. There's going to be an arts contest and we're going to be doing voter education. So if you're there, today is the deadline at, well, five o'clock, but I haven't locked it up yet. So I just dropped the link in the chat for upcoming events. If that's something you want to go to, you got about 10 minutes um, to go there. We have a couple more seats left. Two people had to cancel. Um, on the 24th, we will be in Decatur. Where we're going to be talking about the link in the connection of education and literacy among individuals who are returning home from prison. Most people don't know, but most folks have a third grade level. Um, and they are also building prisons based on reading levels of children. And so we want to get ahead of that and get some education going on that. So that's on the 24th at the Wesley Chapel Library. That's also going to be free. We're going to be giving away gift giveaways and feeding folks. So if you want to do that, please go to the upcoming events tab at our website. And on the 30th, we're going to be closing out Reentry Awareness Month um, with an event with Georgia Justice Project, who is going to be talking about how you can vote with a felony in the state of Georgia and also talk about those who may be eligible to have your probation terminated early. Um, and again, just to be clear, people who are on the registry are eligible to have your probation terminated early in the state of Georgia. Now, that doesn't has nothing to do with you being on the registry, but you can have your probation terminated early. So those events are on our website. As always, we are in need of volunteers and we ask that you donate if you can from $2 to $200 to $2,000. We are in need of whatever you can. No donations go towards salaries. We'd like to thank our guests, Shaniqua, Shaniqua Bunvalane, Pete Privateer, Denny Chan, and Chanel Haley. As always, you were very informative. I, um, I really, really appreciate it. And we will definitely be reaching out to you all. All of you be safe. And um, definitely take care of our elders and use your voice. There's nothing wrong with using your voice to stand up against what is unjust. Thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, we'll be getting this out to y'all by Friday. Thank you.